Well, welcome to the bridge. Welcome to yet another week in our series that we have entitled The End. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, we are systematically, verse by verse, walking through the book of Revelation. Now, I want to tell you up front, I have prayed for quite a while this week and again this morning, and I have asked God to make this day very personal, very powerful, and very persuasive in your life. And I don't apologize for that. You may leave here today not liking the message, but I promise you, you won't leave the same because I know that God is going to speak into your heart today. The question is whether or not you'll listen. And honestly, I can't control that. What I can do is make sure that you hear from the one true living God and that I pray you hear exactly how much he loves you personally, powerfully, and persuasively. Now, I tell you that and say right out of the gate, we've got a long way to go, so I'm going to go fairly quick. Please bear with me. You see up on stage, I have here six boxes on the floor, one up on the stage with me up on the table because I want to walk with you where we have been in the book of Revelation thus far. If you've not been with us, let me give you a quick encapsulation. We started off in chapter 1, and we saw God speaking to the big picture of historical revelation. We see John getting us in tune with what is to come. Chapters 2 and 3, God is speaking to the local churches, to the greater Christian body at large, both then and today. He had an awful lot to tell us. If you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go back walk through the seven letters to the seven churches. In chapter 4 and in chapter 5, we were brought into heaven to the throne room of God. And in chapter 4, we saw what it was to be in heaven and to worship God the Father. And then in chapter 5, to worship Jesus as both the lion and the lamb. And we noted that if you say you want to go to heaven, if you don't really want to worship God down here, you don't really want to go to heaven because heaven is perpetual worship. At the end of chapter 5, as we begin now to go into chapter 6, we see God the Father handing Jesus the scroll, which is the contract or the deed of all history and humanity. And we see that God's wrath is about to unfold. And before he brings his wrath upon the earth and all those that have rejected him, he draws up his church, all the living Christians, the true biblical Christians, not those that take the name, but those who have the heart who live with their lives and not simply speak with their lips the truth of what it is to be a child of God, understanding that Jesus is the only way, but that his gift of grace is extended to all of us. We went into chapter 6, and that's where we saw all hell beginning to break loose. Literally, we saw that at the end of chapter 5, the day of grace has exited humanity, and God's wrath now comes with the church extracted up into heaven, raptured. Literally, the word in the Greek talks to a quick snatching away, a military term of a quick, unexpected snatching away. And now God says to those who have rejected me that are still alive upon the earth, one last chance is coming. The time we know of is the tribulation. Seven years in which the first three and a half years will see a steady, incredible power of God being unleashed upon the earth. But at the halfway mark, we noted that we would go from the tribulation to the great tribulation. In essence, God tells us, as you'll see again today, there are points at which where we say, unbelievable, I couldn't even imagine. And he says to us, you haven't seen anything yet. I put the boxes out to represent the seals. As Jesus takes the scroll and begins to open it, we saw there were seven seals or locks, if you will, on that scroll. And each time he broke a seal, one of God's judgment wraths was unleashed upon the earth. We know this is coming as soon as Jesus takes the church up into the rapture. The first that we saw was that there would become a false peace. Then war would break out all over the earth. War, by the way, that would continue on until Christ's coming. One of the things that you've got to grasp here as we continue to go through and the details become immense is understand that these are not some things that come and go. These are things that build and ramp up. So war breaks out all over the earth. It continues. 
Number three, as the seal opened, we saw that there would be pestilence and famine would come over the earth. As the fourth seal opened, we were told that death would be unleashed. And as a culmination of the first three judgments, 25% of the earth's population would die. In the fifth seal, we saw the prayers of vengeful people who had been given their lives for Christ in the midst of this tribulation time. Those who died the martyrs' deaths crying out, saying, Lord, when will you avenge our death? And the sixth seal, which was chapter 6, unleashed. We saw two weeks ago the powerful expression of what happens when God said, the time is now. And he began by quaking the earth, shaking it off its core, turning the sun black for a part of time, turning the moon blood red for a while, showering the earth with meteors and asteroids, doing something in the atmosphere that was cataclysmic that we don't fully understand yet. And again, rocking the earth to its core to the point where mountains would be leveled and islands would be sunk. That was the sixth seal as the day of the Lord. The, the technical term for God's wrath being unleashed for a last time began. We saw at the end of chapter six as this sixth seal had basically put us back on our heels and we're thinking, oh my goodness. Maybe one of the few times that you could say without blaspheming the Lord, oh my God. Because we saw that the people that would be inhabited at that point realized this is God. Oh, no. And yet even knowing that, we saw that they ran into the rocks, into the caves, that they will literally look for any place to hide. And they cried out and said, we would rather die under an avalanche of the landslide. Bring the rocks down on us. Better to die now in this cave than to continue to feel the wrath of God. From there, we transitioned into chapter 7, and we saw that God wanted to give us a little bit of a reprieve. And in chapter 7, it's as if God says, take a breath. I know that was probably devastating. You're probably still trying to process it. He said, here in chapter 7, I'm going to introduce you to a few different folks. First, he introduced us to what are known as the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes of, of Israel that would become, in the end times, the Jewish evangelists that would so powerfully impact Israel, and then the rest of the world. We saw that they will be incredible missionaries. We'll see more of them in chapter 14 and we get a closer look. But we also saw in chapter 7 in the second half those martyred saints that had given their lives in the tribulation now crying out, praising God. And we saw that their battle cry, both the 144,000 and those who had given their lives, were the song that we shared last week and then again here at Share the Love Time. My God reigns here. We closed out last week at the end of chapter 7, seeing that in the midst of this time where we're taking a breath, God sends four angels up to what are called the corners of the world. And he says to them, hold back the wrath. Remember, these things are ongoing. They're, they're pouring out. This uh, atrocity, these calamities are happening on a perpetual basis. And God sends four angels to the four corners of the earth. And he says, hold back the winds of my wrath until the 144,000 have been given the seal of God on their forehead. We left last week at the end of chapter 7 with a calm over the earth as the 144,000 are getting God's seal. We pick up this morning, now going into chapter 8 of Revelation, getting ready to go into the seventh seal of judgment, the last of seven seals of judgment. Come with me now into God's word as we open up Revelation chapter 8. I pray that today will be personal powerful and persuasive in your life. God's word says this, Revelation chapter 8, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I want you to get this. Goes.
about 30 seconds. All of heaven, when they saw what was inside the scroll when the seventh seal was broken, went silent for about half an hour. I want you to think a little bit about that because I'll tell you straight up, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the calm before the storm. You say, what do you mean before the storm, Pastor Jeff? We just walked through. I mean, there's hell unleashed on earth. People are crying out, Lord, take my life. I'd rather die than live through your continued wrath. What do you mean the calm before the storm? You know, meteorologists tell us that oftentimes as a hurricane travels, there's a point in the middle where things get deathly silent and calm. That as the hurricane travels over and you get the wrath of the hurricane, perhaps here's the front side of the hurricane. When the eye travels over you, there will be a time where you can come out and it's dead calm. The calm before the second part of the storm. And oftentimes, the whipping effect of the second back half of the hurricane is far worse than the front side. We're being told by the word of God, because he loves you and doesn't want you to be caught off guard, that the first side is nothing compared. <sighs> nothing compared to what's in here. You say, Pastor Jeff, how bad could the last one be if the first six were like this? Enough to take your breath away if you were in heaven. Not just John, but the angels as well. All that were there. We've been in heaven with them in chapters four and five and we've been walking with them. It's been a noisy place. All of a sudden, to look inside and see what's in the scroll after the seventh seal and all of heaven goes deathly silent for half an hour. Have you ever been in a place like that? Where the reality of what is coming actually dropped you to your knees, took your breath away? Have you ever been in the place where because you knew what was coming? In fifth grade, I had a letter sent home with me. I'll never forget it. You can tell I'm scarred by it even now. My fifth grade teacher sent a letter home, told my dad that I was a habitual time waster and a distraction to the other students. Bummer to be me. I want you to know when I read that letter and I was told I had to give it to my dad. I'm not even going to get into what happened when my dad got it. But I'll tell you this, it was the time between when I read the letter and when I got the wrath of my dad that my life changed. The wrath was the exclamation mark. The real pivot point for me was that fearing, that knowing of what was coming. We have an opportunity here with John for that. I wanna ask you personally, have you ever been in that place where you knew what was coming and it, God made it clear, you better change or else. I spent some time with somebody on Thursday who heard that song, Born Again, who responded and said, yes, Lord. I understand what's waiting for me if I don't change. You see, the book of Revelation is telling us what will happen to those down the road that refuse in that time. Well, the parallel for us is that that's your day if you don't accept him now. The beauty of it is, and the reason why I call Revelation a love letter, is because this is the story of those who will have a much tougher time. Today, you can say yes, and it'll cost you nothing in terms of things that matter. It'll cost you your life to accept this free gift. Let me show you somebody that I saw this week who looked in, saw what was coming, and surrendered and said, yes, Lord.
My name's Shane Sweeney. God bless everyone that watches this. Um, I've led a path of destruction, a lot of ups and downs, and uh, I always thought it was, you know, the person inside of me, or, you know, I thought I had control of everything that I've done in my life, you know, drinking and all the drugs in my background, and, um, you know, my recent separation from my wife, um, you know, dealing with the kids being gone, and uh, just not knowing what was going to go on with my life, and uh, just feeling real tired and depressed about everything. Didn't know which way to go um, with anything, really, trying to make my own decisions. And uh, Jesus reached down to me and uh, gave me a blessing. Being the person that I was and the person that I am now and the person that I know I can be, um, listening to Jesus and um, just giving my all um, to Jesus. I came to believe, um, I came to believe everything in my past has brought me to where I am now in the arms of Jesus and now I can honestly say I am a true believer. The scenery behind me is where I was baptized um, Thursday night at church band practice and uh, one of the best days of my life and I actually that night felt made me feel more comfortable than uh, I've ever felt. I, I, I honestly feel um, I have a void um, that has been filled in my heart and my soul. I'm new to um, believing in Jesus and letting go of everything I thought I was and uh, I was doing for myself and I now realize that you can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. I've uh, deleted all the bad music and everything on my iPods and uh, my computer and my phone ringtones. Um, and I just gave up on deciding for myself. I know Jesus holds it all in his hand. and. Uh, he would never get me, um, he would never give me anything I could not handle. I got something that I have never had in my life and it's a comfort and it's just the plain joy of believing in my Lord and Savior and nothing could ever take that away from me. I feel happier now and more joy now than I have ever felt in my life and it's because I pray that my Jesus and Lord is there for me and I believe in everything in me that he will do what's best. I hope this story uh, reaches out to a lot of people that watch this and uh, just to comfort them and for them to know that if you do believe and you put all your power, your heart, soul, and mind, and everything you have into um, just letting go of everything you think is right and listen to Jesus speak to you, he will do everything he can to make sure that you are okay in the end. If Amen. That Shane, our new brother in the Lord. Let me quote him, paraphrasing. If you will give all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus will make sure that you'll be okay in the end. Doesn't really matter what's in that box. Doesn't matter what's in that seal if you're a child of God because it won't apply to you. Now with that said... It does apply to those that don't give their heart to the Lord. So let's go in and see. God's word says in verse 2, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So what's in this seventh seal? What makes the last one so bad? The last one is not the last one. 
The last one contains seven more. Jim Waldrop picked out this bag. If you can see it. It looks funny, but it's apropos, because you don't want what's in this bag. You don't want the seven judgments, what are now known as the seven trumpet judgments that were contained in the seventh seal judgment. You see, what put all of heaven on their heels was the fact that this is not the last one. The last one contains the last ones. Just when you thought it was over, seven more judgments, each one promising to be worse than the last. The easiest of the seven trumpets is more difficult and harsh than the worst of the seven seals. You get the picture. Well, in this, John and all those in heaven, you could imagine just saying, oh no, oh no. And then we see now in verses three through five, yet another angel is gonna surface. Seven angels show up to blow these seven trumpets, each one containing yet another judgment of God. And then God's word says this, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and before I give you the and, let me just explain the seven angels come, each one now getting to blow their own trumpet of judgment. Seven more judgments coming. And before they do, another angel shows up and he has what we would consider like a cistern or a, a plate that we would use back in Old Testament times in the worship process. You see, they would put hot coals on this plate from the altar that was used to sacrifice burnt offerings and they would bring it into the temple, into the holier place that was designed for prayer offerings. They would take this hot plate, fill it with coals from the burnt offerings. They would go get this very good smelling incense, pour it on the hot coals, and then bring it to the prayer altar so that the prayers and the beautiful smell would go up into the nostrils of God. That was the thought process. That was the symbolism. So now as the trumpet angels show up getting ready to blow their horns of judgment, before that can happen, another angel shows up and it's one of the angels from the worship process. He brings this cistern, fills it with hot coals, pours the incense on it to say, smell, Lord, smell the prayers of your people. However, this time something is very, very different. Rather than this cistern and the incense being lifted up into the nostrils of God as praise and worship, listen to what happens. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. A firestorm is dropped down on the earth from heaven above as this prayer cistern filled with fire and coal is thrown down on the earth. What is known to be a component of worship is now being unleashed as a part of God's wrath. The connection here is the prayers of those who had said, God, when will you avenge us? Are now answered right now. The angel throws the cistern down upon the earth. People say a lot of symbolism in Revelation. I have come to find as I study, there's a whole lot less symbolism than people think there is. Because I will tell you this, before we're done today, I pray that you will see not only current events, but modern science being spoken out of the book of Revelation. I've told you before, people think that this is kind of a far off, sometime, somebody else kind of book. I want you to realize that this is our book and it may be for our day. You may not get into 2010 before you see the power of God. You may, you may not get home for lunch. You may have seven more generations of kids in your family. I don't know, but I know this. God's hand is moving and he's made it very clear that things are in place and he could come anytime. You say, what would this look like? What do you mean? 
Let me show you exactly what it might look like if God unleashes a firestorm on the earth as this cistern is thrown down by the angel. It is not as far-fetched as you might think. It could very much look like a firestorm that we would associate with a small meteor or meteor shower, not happening up in the stars where it makes for a pretty night view, but where it peppers the earth and continues with this system of wrath and havoc being unleashed upon only those people who had rejected Christ before he raptured his church. This cistern being thrown down on the earth might look something like this. Okay, depending on your disposition, you may be sitting there thinking, okay, impressive graphics, powerful possibilities, but come on, Pastor Jeff, really now? Very unlikely. That's not very realistic. Remember you thought that. Stay with me. Let's move on now. God's word takes us into verse 6, where we now see the trumpets and the angels are now coming into play. Verse 6 of chapter 8 in God's word says this, Then the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Here we go. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood. And it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. You say, wow, what I want you to understand is this is not just havoc without measure. This is God's precision wrath. Note that he says one-third, one-third, one-third. He's in full control of what's happening here. This is the hand of God. This is precision wrath. But now you say, all right, what does that look like? Hail mixed with fire and blood? Well, remember now, as the angel threw the cistern down and the firestorm came upon the earth, I want you to know that if we're hit with some kind of a meteor or asteroid, one of the things that will happen is it will quake the earth. One of the things you saw in verse 5 is we're told that there'll be thunder and peals of lightning, that there will be an earthquake. Well, I want you to understand something, and I don't mean to get scientific on you, and I had a geology class in college and I hated it but I learned some things that apply here. There is a direct relationship between earthquakes and volcanoes. Hear me again. There's a direct relationship between earthquakes and volcanoes. Each one has the ability to cause the other. And if you say, well, okay, what's the big deal? I want you to think about hail mixed with fire looking like it's coming with blood. And I would say this to you, if you've ever been in the presence of a volcano, as the molten lava and the fire rocks are showering down, it could look an awful lot like this. 
You say, okay, Pastor Jeff, but uh, a third of the earth, a third of the trees and all of the green grass, you don't get that with a volcano. I mean, a volcano is basically like a pimple on the skin of the earth. It's like popping a pimple, <laughs> off it goes. Ugly graphic, I know, but realistic. You're not going to ruin a third of the earth that way. You're absolutely right. But are you familiar with calderas? Are you familiar with what's known as supervolcanoes? Where instead of a little pimple on the surface of the earth, you've got 30, 40, 50, 60 miles of earth underneath that will come rupturing out like a cancer upon the earth. Not cut out, but bursting out. Might look a little bit like what the first trumpet judgment says. Let me show you one of the scientists who happens to believe that all the world is going to end in 2012 because of the Mayans. We may come to different conclusions, but let me tell you, he shares some truth about the science that brings current events in and through your Bible. Watch this. A volcano is one of those cones that pops off and, you know, it's, it's, it's splendid and majestic and, and sometimes locally catastrophic. But a supervolcano is a very different thing. 30, 40 square miles under the ground blows up sky high like pricking a balloon filled with lava and, and hot gas. And that has the capability of really destroying civilization as we know it around the world. Last time it happened, 74,000 years ago, in Lake Toba, Indonesia, 90% of the people alive in the world then died because of that eruption. 90%. In today's figures, that'd be about five and a half billion deaths. We've got a couple of dozen of these supervolcanoes, or calderas as they're also known, around the world. We don't really know how many because they can be under the ocean, which covered. Oceans cover 70, 75% of the Earth's surface. Any one of these babies goes, civilization is at peril. Normally, we, don't, we try not to worry about these things. This is not just to point out the obvious. But the way the sun has been behaving, causing massive dislocations electromagnetically with plasma infusions, and of course, in our climate and atmosphere, it's entirely possible that a supervolcano on the edge, like Yellowstone, is widely reported to be can, will, must, blow. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Revelation just came alive. You say, well, come on. Again, Pastor Jeff, possible, but not very likely. Come on, where's the real relevance? I don't know if you heard him, but there are known to be about 25 of these calderas all over the earth. And we don't know what's under the sea. One of them is right here at home in our country. I don't know if you heard them. Yellowstone National Park is widely known to be a supervolcano. It's a caldera. The whole underbelly. Now let me take you back a number of weeks and I said to you, do you ever wonder why or how it could be that the United States could not be a major player on the world stage in the book of Revelation? We talked about the potential of nuclear attack from terrorists. We talked about the potential of financial collapse turning us into something more like a third world country. Well, what happens if our caldera goes off? Say, well, that's not going to happen. Please, give me a break. Let me show you. Let me take you to Yellowstone National Park. Watch very carefully because I'm going to make a note in this video about a 30 seconds in from December 27th of last year through the first half of January of this year, what you're about to see became a very real possibility. All of the signs, including what are known as swarms of earthquakes, were measured and happened under Yellowstone National Park. This is real, this is right here at home, and it is relevant to today. Geologists would look out for new warning signs that would tell them an eruption is imminent. You start to see swarms of earthquakes as fresh magma moved into the system and broke the rock above it and it started to rise.
This is what magma racing towards the surface might sound like. For anyone brave or foolish enough to remain in the hazard zone, the chances of escape would be slim. The Big Bang would be moments away. of a super eruption would be awesome enough but it's nothing compared to what would follow within an hour of a Yellowstone super eruption pyroclastic flows could race across the countryside and engulf the valley of Jackson Hole and the town of Livingston some 50 miles away within a 60 mile radius 90% of any remaining people would be killed a few might be blown to pieces in the initial blast. Most would suffocate in the heat of pyroclastic flows. But this would just be the beginning. Blowing across the states would be the mother of all ash clouds, an aerial mountain of deadly particles and debris. Yellowstone National Park is the site of a recurring supervolcano. An eruption so large that if it happens again, it would destroy nearly everything within 60 miles. But what would happen next as a mountain of ash begins to spread and then fall? The Yellowstone super eruption could throw ash 15 miles into the atmosphere the fallout could cover half the United States. Three days after the eruption, the skies would be dark and deadly. From scientists' predictions, Naked Science has pieced together a picture of the country after three days of ashfall. At six times heavier than wet snow, wet ash would cause many roofs to collapse, clog up filters of cars, and ground aircraft across much of the western US. Any planes in flight would be in danger of crashing. January of this year, those swarms of earthquakes were happening. Remember, an earthquake is what will trigger a volcano. And one of the things our world of science tells us is we don't understand where, when, why, and how earthquakes are gonna come. We basically get a little bit of heads up and then we try to figure out what happened after the fact. We may be one more earthquake away from God's unleashing this. You say, yeah, but again, Pastor Jeff, I just don't know. Well, let's go on and let's take a look at the second angel and his trumpet. Because he says this in verse 8, the second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea was turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. Something like a mountain ablaze was thrown into the ocean, killing a third of everything in it. You say, well, what could that be? And again, how realistic is that? I'll answer what it could be in a minute. But let me show you just how realistic it is. You're not going to believe this. So while we all went about our lives yesterday, we came very close to a catastrophic event here on planet Earth, and we didn't know about it. It turns out we just missed getting hit by an asteroid. A piece of solid rock, roughly the size of a 10-story building. Now, I say just missed because it came within 45,000 miles of us. That's a lot closer than the moon is, and scientists say way too close for something that big. Had it struck, again, they, the people who tell us about these things, say the impact could have had the force of a thousand Hiroshima-strength atomic bombs over a huge All area right. of the Earth. You get the picture. You're not going to get a memo 
that says, oh, by the way, three weeks from Tuesday. But if you don't think it's possible, NBC Nightly News, Brian Williams. Hey, guess what, folks? We just missed getting hit by an asteroid. I'm not here to tell you it's going to happen on this day or that day or whatever, but I'm reading you God's word and I'm showing you current events that say you better connect the dots because if you continue to pretend like this isn't real or not relevant or not timely, you're going to build yourself your own little, your own little spot of hell. I know that's harsh, but that's real. Third trumpet, third angel comes out. Very similar to the second. The third angel sounded his trumpet and, the, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on the third of the rivers and the springs of water. The name of the star was Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Here's a place where people get caught up. Don't worry about naming the asteroid or the meteor. Wormwood in their context was a shrub it was a plant, and the leaves of that plant were used to make poison. What we're told here, and I don't know who's going to name that meteor, probably God, but for our understanding, the meteor will come and it will bring poison to fresh water, and it will come as a blazing star. Now, the first one that we saw with the second trumpet comes like a burning mountain into the water. The second one comes like a burning meteor of some sort. I'm going to show you one more video, and as an aside, just for kicks, we're going to bring Pink Floyd into the church. I'm going to show you one more video. This is of a cataclysmic meteor coming upon the earth. I'm going to show you what scientists tell us it will look like. What you're going to see is a meteor that is approximately 300 miles in diameter. For a third, and this meteor you will see is going to devastate the entire planet. For the earth to have the impact that is in the Bible, we would need to assume that this will be roughly one-third the size. So here's a 300-mile meteor. If it were a 100-mile meteor, according to these estimations, exactly what we just read will come. And a smaller one, nonetheless, hitting the fresh water would work the same. What's important is that you see how realistic this is and how powerful it will be. The nightly news told you we just missed it happening. This will show you what will happen when God's word, not if, when God's word happens and comes alive. It's about four and a half minutes. Just soak this in.
question is, where do you want to be when that happens? You can be in heaven, at home with the Lord, or if you haven't expired before then, and you're down here on earth, you can go through that. Question is, what are you going to do? I prayed this morning that today's message would be personal, powerful, and persuasive. What are you going to do with this truth? Two more verses and then we're done with chapter 8. Verse 12 takes us to the fourth trumpet, the fourth angel. Tells us this, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon and a third of the stars. So that a third of them turned black. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. Pretty easy to understand when you look at what has happened here with this super volcano explosions. When you look at the meteors hitting shaking the earth at its very core. It's not difficult to understand that the sky would go black. Think of what would happen in terms of our ecosystem. You see here, these first four trumpets have literally created a complete eco-wrath. The first devastated the land. The second devastated the sea. The third devastated all fresh water, or a third of it. And the fourth devastated the skies and the heavens. Now, something very peculiar to close out chapter 8. We're in the midst of yet this unleashing of a perpetual wrath that is unimaginable. And yet, to close out, God's word says this, John speaking, As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Whoa! 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 to the inhabitants of the earth because I stop here and ask you what is the because? God is crying out woe, woe, woe to you the inhabitants of the earth because why? What is the because? I met somebody this week who understands the because, who knows the right answer and is doing the best he can to live it out. I want to share his small part of his story in asking this question as we close out now, going from the fourth trumpet to the fifth, God sends this message, whoa, 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 to you inhabitants of the earth because my friend David understands the answer. Because what? Listen to a bit of his story, and then we'll finish for this morning. Um, I was brought up in the in a religious sense, I've always went to church, but um, I just got away from myself, got away from church, did my own thing, and I just consumed myself, like I was saying, it was, I feel like I had everything, I had, you know, the family, the money, the, I could do what I wanted, when I wanted, and it got to me, a power trip or whatnot, it's, it was, it had its ups and downs, it's, in the end it wasn't really worth anything. It's not, you know, without the love and Jesus in your life, it's, it's pretty uh, empty really, no matter what you have. It's, um, it's just hopeless. <laughs> um, a lot of people always looked up to me, you know, because of the things I've had. I guess they wanted what I had, but really inside, it's it wasn't it wasn't really anything. Um, you know, one day it all just comes to a crash and hole. If you don't hear God calling you, you will hear Him calling you. If you don't answer His call, then you're gonna pay for it. Basically, is what I've learned. It's um, He's been calling me my whole life and I turn away and keep doing what I want to do. And this cost me over and over again. It's, um, 
it's a hard lesson to be learned. It's um, it's taken me my whole life to learn it, pretty much. When you, when you give yourself and you submit to God, and you answer His call. It's it's what you're here for, and and He makes it. He makes life just a blessing. There's nothing that can hurt you, no matter how bad it is. Now the crisis in my life, it's, I just know in my mind that I can handle anything. No matter what it is, big or small, you, you put the obstacle in front of me, I'm gonna jump over it. It's, I can do it now. It's, How can you do it? Why, why are you able can, to do it now? It's, I can do it now because I have Christ to pull me over top of it. it if you ask him, he's, he's there for you. It's the bottom line. He's there for you. He wants to help you. You just have to let him help you. And uh, it's, it's about obeying. It's about serving God. If you serve God, it, I mean, it's, it's one of the greatest joys in life. It's, um, it's opened up so many new doors. I was stuck in a rut, you know, even had a lot of the comforts that everybody else strives to get. You know, it's, you still, you're just missing this piece of yourself without Christ. It's, um... Does he make you whole? Yeah, Christ makes you whole. Makes you whole, for sure. It's. I'd say it's even more than whole. It's it's this. It, it's overwhelming. You can't even explain it. It's just what you've been searching for forever. You know the things you're afraid of. You're not afraid of anything. There's there's nothing to be afraid of. I've been down a rough road. It's I've done it all. I've been I've been everywhere and I've done everything, good and bad. And I'm, it's um. No, there's, there's nobody too far to be saved. It's the Lord calls everybody. You just have to answer, and um, you know in your heart when He's calling you. It's 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 a gimme. You know, you feel it in your heart. God puts it in everybody's heart to know right from wrong. And if you do what's right, it, it has its rewards. It's He blesses you. And if you do what's wrong, you're going to pay the price. It's you're, 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 you're creating your own hell, basically. The people that don't believe, I'm going to have to say, you have to give it a shot. Otherwise, you're going to create a hell for yourself that there's nobody that can help you but God. And if it's too late, it's too late. So hopefully you, you answer his call before it's too late. Um, if you don't buy into it, may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> woe, woe, woe to you inhabitants upon the earth, because the trumpet blasts that are about to be sounded are even worse than what you've seen thus far. David knew the answer to the question, why are we being told, whoa, whoa, whoa? Because now you know the truth. And the truth can and will set you free. But if you reject it, what is coming ahead will be far worse than anything you've seen thus far. Worse than anything that your worst nightmare could imagine. And it'll be self-induced because I stand here before you today as God's representative offering you his gift of grace, 
on his behalf, on the promises and the power of God that says nobody has to go through that. If you will lay down yourself, if you will surrender who you want to be and who you think you deserve to be and embrace who you can be as a child of God, that doesn't have to be your story. All that you saw today that is coming can be avoided if you will lay down self and pick up God's offer of eternal life through Jesus Christ as his Lord, as your personal Lord and Savior. Anybody who rejects this, to quote my friend David, may God have mercy on your soul because you are creating your own hell. I pray today that this message, God's word, not mine, would be personal, powerful, and persuasive in your life. I now leave you with your God. Lord, I come to you now praying on behalf of a people who know what it is to recognize the hand of God. We see you so mightily at work in our midst. We are so blessed to have a church family that knows the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit, that you are here and amongst us. Lord, we're not ashamed of you and we're not ashamed of saying that we are devoted followers of Christ. Lord, we are blessed to say that all that we are looking at, this tribulation and great time of tribulation, we will not know that place. And yet our heart breaks for those that we love who will. Lord, help us in our sense of blessing, not to become smug and to hide in the corners of our Christian cocoons. Lord, let us take this love and light that you have given to us and let us share it. Father, I pray that you break our hearts with the things that break your hearts, that no one will sit smug, satisfied with the fact that they're not going to have to go through this. And let us live lives of poured out servitude for you, that nobody we know will have to go through the reality of eternal separation from you, nor the nightmare of the tribulation time. Give us both a want to and the wisdom to share. Let our life be a time of worship that draws others to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I know today was probably longer than normal, heavier than normal. But I want you to know that God wrote chapter 8 of the book of Revelation because he loves you. He loves you personally. Think about this. He has given you all the answers to his eternal test. And he has painted the most vivid picture of what will happen to those who fail the test. He's given you all the answers. And he's told you emphatically, vividly, what will happen if you fail the one important question of eternity. What more could you ask for? There are no more excuses. God's love has blown up your excuses. I'm going to pray with and for anybody that would like to be prayed with or for. There'll be others that'll come down and help me. If you don't know what it is to have this assurance, if you want Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I promise you there are people here that want to walk with you and will help you. I've heard it said by somebody with a powerful ministry that I wouldn't walk across this stage to share my religion with you, but I'd crawl through miles of broken glass to share my Jesus. That's the promise that's here. If you don't know that you know that you know that you have a home in heaven, don't leave here today in that same condition.